Um, I will share this screen and hopefully, how does that look? We can see it. Okay. We need yes, a thumbs yes. up. Okay. Awesome. Um, so thanks everyone um, for being here. Just make sure I have my screens uh, correctly up and running. Um, yeah. Thanks everyone um, for, for being here. Um, CLF Austin, we have, I'll mention this, we've cross promoted this with uh, CLF Dallas. So I think some of the things we're going to cover today are, are not necessarily regionally specific by any means. So um, hopefully, and I, I think there's some names that I recognize from uh, CLF Dallas and hopefully some more folks will trickle in. So thanks for being here uh, with us. We had done an LCA workshop um, last year. I think Martine and I went over um, we looked at Athena and, and Tally. So that is actually up on our YouTube page, which we can, we can mention and, and talk about linking to that. So some of that's there, but we thought it might be good in our discussions at the end of the year last year to come back and go through another LCA workshop. Um, like I said, just, you know, bring it on more, the more the merrier and the more uh, tools that we can sort of see uh, the better. So we're going to go through a little bit of just, just again, kind of the, the, LCA slash whole building LCA in the intro, and then some uh, what I call sort of quick and dirty tools. We have a few links of just some very basic stuff that we kind of hope people might, uh, you know, favorite and just visit on occasion to, to get some uh, high level numbers. And then what I sort of call slightly less quick and clean tools <laughs> presented with us from one click and building transparency. So we'll talk a little bit about Tally, we'll talk about one click LCA. Um, so yeah, moving on just real quick um, intro and uh, sort of reminders uh, to, to everyone. I'm sure you all kind of know uh, what we're doing here and why, but just as, as reminders, we're obviously talking a lot about the upfront embodied carbon and the production of the materials that we're using in the building projects, uh, less so on the operational carbon, although as I always say, and sort of my soapboxes, these can affect one another. Things that you think are reducing some of your operational energy consumption uh, might not actually be working out in the whole carbon story of, of a building. So th things to consider. Obviously, we'll focus on the embodied carbon. Um, this is a, a slide that I made. I, I always joke it's not necessarily to scale, but again, it's just that sort of reminder about the uh, CO2 emissions over the building lifespan and in manufacturing and construction. We get sort of little carbon bumps. You keep the lights on for, uh, you know, whatever, 30 years, maybe a major renovation, also sort of carbon bump in the materials that have come in, keep the lights on again uh, for another you know, whatever it is, 30 years, 60 years, end of life. So we have demolition, some of that transportation and waste processing that goes in. So sort of mapping through those modules of, uh, of LCA in comparison to the operational energy use. So this turns out to kind of be the entire um, carbon story of the building. Um, we do want to say, uh, obviously, we sort of have, have the carbon goggles on and we're, and we're looking through that lens, uh, obviously, in the face of uh, dramatic climate change, which is important. However, as we uh, have talked about and have certainly talked about in the EPD discussion, um, there are other um, impact categories that we do look at that, that LCAs and whole building LCAs look at, which also uh, can be very important. So it's not just carbon, although we talk about that a lot. Um, we want to remind ourselves that it is um, slightly larger in, in scope. Um, so again, LCA is the methodology um, estimating environmental impacts through a product life cycle, sort of cradle to grave, and then whole building LCA is kind of a combination of those sort of individual LCAs. I like to think of the whole building is, you know, say we had an EPD for every single thing that goes into your project, we've added them all up, and here's sort of that carbon story, embodied carbon story, and other impact categories. Um, and then obviously, you know, looking at this holistically, you can help in design to um, to reduce the footprint um, where desired. So um, I want to let me let me jump out here, or these these links might just work. So I, I did want to note some quick tools, and again, we'll we'll post this, and and I think there'll be a this will be on YouTube and and all that. But um, some quick tools that I've run across or I've seen other people use is just 
you know, sort of, sort of swags, <laughs> like the, the scientific kind of wild ass cast, I think a little bit closer uh, than, than that on some of these, but one that I've seen used and the disclaimer on build carbon neutral is I think it's, it's, it's pretty old and, and maybe other folks might have some better sort of very quick tools, quick and dirty tools, and feel free to put them in the chat. We'll, we'll do questions at the end, bring them up because we want to get uh, more of these. This is just one I've actually seen pretty pretty well-known good design firms use this in their upload to DDX. So their Architecture 2030, they'll use build carbon neutral and, and sort of use that as a um, as that ballpark estimate for what their carbon impact is. And I have done very basic you know, do a lot of tally analysis on a on a building that's, you know, steel with concrete foundations, you get about this many pounds per square foot doing the math on build carbon neutral, I found that it does sort of line up at least get you in the ballpark. So, um, so, you know, you really just putting in square feet stories above ground stories below ground, you pick your primary structural system. Um, this actually works through some of the eco regions and it looks at, I think it's, it's trying to estimate some of the carbon impact of actually the land use that's going on with the building project. Um, and I think if we just put in kind of any numbers here, um, so it's essentially looking at a 25,000 square foot six story building and you calculate and it gives you a metric tons estimate of CO2. So again, people might have better tools that are sort of like this to give you a very general idea. But if you, if you were, if you could imagine we have something due tomorrow and, it, and we need sort of answers on if we, if we use A, B or C structural system wise, you can get some results from, uh, from build carbon neutral. Um, the other one that I think, I think we know, and we've looked at, and, and again, open to suggestions on this. I think Payette is sort of still working on this, or this is still valid, but they have sort of flooring and envelope. I've seen the future systems coming soon for a long time. So I don't know what sort of Payette is up to with this, but nonetheless, um, I have used this to look at very quick envelope. Because again, we talk a lot about structure, but as an architect, I sort of think about obviously our envelope and what we're doing with our insulation and some of the cladding. So it gives you some ideas of some of the masonry veneers and some general uh, global warming potential. Um, and then you can actually do a calculator. So you can sort of build out, I think your layers, I think is, is kind of what, um, you know, what you might be looking at here. Um, and then they have, um, Sort of form steel panel and this and that, or, or at least some options comparison. Um, and then, you know, you can put in your square footage and it'll kind of give you some of those kilograms of CO2. Um, so again, I don't know where they pulled this in the back end, but it's just sort of very quick comparisons that, that you can do to, uh, to get some answers out. And then one that I do know is, is vetted pretty well, probably by um, people on this call, <laughs> is the... Um, SE 2050 calculator, which again is very quick, more geared toward um, toward structural engineers, I would say. But that said, it's not that hard for an architect to, especially if there's been a if there's been a cost estimate. You know, the GC threw some number at this, right? And if you can sort of ask to get that number for cubic yards of concrete, um, tons of steel, masonry, even timber, you can start to input these numbers. Um, and I had was telling Swarna, I was joking with her. I, as an architect, I, I don't know if these are good. I have no idea. I don't know if a thousand cubic yards is a, is a small house or a 25,000 square foot. I don't know, but nonetheless, you can start to get the pounds of CO2. And um, there are some, I think if you can put in, I don't know if you give your 250, 25,000 short, whatever, um, you can get your pounds for CO2 square foot. Um, so, you know, again, very quick tool to just look at your, um, look at your structural system, but it is, um, it is interesting. And again, I'll, I'll ask, um, sort of, um, in the chat and, um, right. So there, there's a, um, uh, request to, to throw these links in the chat, which we'll, we'll definitely do, um, as well. So, 
those are a few that I've seen that I've used. I did want to hit very quickly on benchmarking. And again, this might be one that is suggested. Um, the Carbon Leadership Forum did a benchmark study. I, I, I know that they're sort of updating this. And I know I think SC2050 is taking on some of this benchmarking. But I did want to at least throw out there this link of sort of very high level benchmarking of where you might be. And you can, you can go by program type, building use, um, you know, public assembly buildings. This was done, I, I don't know when they were collecting data for this, but it's been, it's been a while uh, in the years for sure. But nonetheless, some, some benchmarking that you can sort of look at of the uh, initial embodied carbon of different building use programs, locations, number of stories above grade, that sort of thing. Um, and you can at least, like I said, get into the ballpark and kind of see where you're, where you're comparing uh, benchmarks. So, um, back here, and um, again, just running through um, some of those, which again, we can um, certainly uh, supply the links and, and hopefully we'll get some more, uh, more to add to that list. So um, quickly, before we have our speakers talk, I wanted to give some quick logistics. Again, uh, CLF Dallas, I, I wanna thank folks from Dallas who are here. We cross-promoted this, so hopefully, everyone can learn a little bit about some of these tools and obviously one click and tally. Um, so we, uh, Swarna has been amazing and actually making a website for CLF Austin. Um, and this slide does not do it justice at all, <laughs> which I've made very quickly, but nonetheless, um, CLF ATX, and we will start to push this out to folks. Um, you can find sort of everything CLF Austin there. The YouTube links to these meetings will be obviously post on YouTube, but then link to on the website. Um, the events that we'll have, I think the sign up, the register for the events goes to the Zoom registration. So, you know, down the line, we'll, we'll point people to here to, uh, to sign up. And then um, our next meeting, I think is probably in June tentatively. I think we'll, we'll do something in June. We don't fully know what yet, but I think we, definitely have some good ideas. So CLF Austin will be in June and um, certainly we can we can see what what cross promotion there can be with other sort of CLFs in this region. Um, if it's not um, city or kind of regionally specific, we can we can open that up to more folks. So um, I think that's it for some of our intro work. Um, Michaela and Ari uh, from one click. So uh, Michaela won't be joining us, but Ari, we, we're in good hands. Ari will demo and walk through a little bit of one click. And Kelsey is going to talk a little bit about Tally, uh, maybe how that's working with EC3 coming from, from building transparency. We'll do 20 to 30, around 25 minutes per. So hopefully we can get into some pretty good detail about how these tools work. And then we'll give about 20 minutes for questions. Um, questions in the chat. Um, you know, normal sort of Zoom rules. We'll be monitoring the chat and we can, um, at the appropriate time, sort of um, ask folks, ask the speakers the questions, and then we can also wait till the end and, and kind of open the forum back up to everyone. Um, also, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of terrible at intros. So uh, Ari and Kelsey, please add to, please add to your life <laughs> other than where you are now. Uh, if you want to give us a little background about how you ended up doing what you're doing and then and then show off the tools, uh, that would be fantastic. So I can um, I can stop sharing and we'll push it over to, I think Ari, you're gonna go first, right? Yeah, uh, awesome. Well, thank you so much, Tom. And yeah, thanks so much to the whole CLF Austin and Dallas team uh, for putting it together um, today. I think um, it's just exciting and encouraging to see how many people are uh, involved and interested in LCA. And uh, we're obviously at One Click LCA really happy to uh, support however we can. Um, I guess briefly about me. So um, I, uh, I studied building technology in my undergrad at MIT. Um, and then following that, did a PhD in embodied carbon and uh, timber construction. And um, obviously I've been uh, since then working in the embodied carbon space and uh, just really excited about tackling this problem, which uh, as we're seeing in these past year or two, in particular, is seeing a lot of attention um, in, the, in the AEC community. So it's uh, awesome to yeah, connect with all you guys and uh, talk a little bit about kind of the, 
the tools and methods we might actually use to, to kind of to solve the problem. Uh, so I will, let's see if I can grab my screen. If I can pick the right one. All right. And I will apologize in advance because I think due to the weather, uh, there's a bit of <laughs> Wi-Fi issues here where I am. So uh, if I'm if I'm cutting out at all, maybe um, just stop me, Tom, and I'll maybe try to slow down, or or we can we can figure out what would work best. Um, but is everyone able to see uh, my screen and the slide? Yes. Perfect. Awesome. So uh, we kind of focused this talk really around. Uh, or just a brief presentation really around, obviously everyone here is committed, excited about embodied carbon, wants to do something about it. Um, and we would obviously love to help you guys um, achieve those goals. Um, so as we know, and as Tom mentioned, uh, embodied carbon is gonna be increasingly important with all the construction that's expected to occur over the next 30 years. Uh, and the relative importance of embodied carbon is gonna, Probably increase though, Tom. I like that you highlighted that interplay between embodied and operational um, carbon. I think increasingly over time, we're going to see that decision making process um, highlighted um, and become of increasing importance as we try to get to zero. Um, with regards to priorities, you know, some might argue that because those embodied emissions are happening right now, and given the urgency, as we know, of the time frame we have to act uh, decisively on carbon. Um, it just puts a, an additional um, onus on us as, as architects, as structural engineers, um, as MEP engineers, anyone working in building design responsible for materials um, to, to do our best. Um, so a little bit about one-click LCA um, and kind of where we sit within the industry. Um, so we actually try to work comprehensively across um, the entire construction industry. Um, so we work with uh, manufacturers um, to support uh, the creation of EPDs. So we have automated EPD generator tools where manufacturers can collect their own data about their processes and the raw materials they're using and so on um, and produce EPDs, um, have them verified through our platform and published. Um, we're also working obviously uh, with building designers. So architects, engineers, everyone um, responsible for that design process. Um, and we have a variety of tools uh, aimed at helping um, helping designers. And then lastly, we're doing actually, we're working with uh, businesses, real estate companies, developers um, on assessing the impacts of their building portfolios, for example, or, or the emissions associated with their business as a whole. So GHG reporting. Um, and kind of integral to our strategy really is that we prioritize um, high quality data available around the world. Um, and so we have um, 100,000 plus uh, data points of EPDs and generic data. Um, and we also have a localization procedure for, as we know, there are gaps um, in some of that really high quality EPD data locally. Um, so our localization procedure allows you to um, take a good quality manufacturer specific EPD data point uh, from somebody outside of your region um, and actually through some modifications to adjust for things like grid mix, for example, um, you can actually localize that data. So we're trying to make it as easy as possible for everyone to have access to the best possible, best quality data that they can, um, so that when you do your assessment, you know that it's founded on, um, on good data. Um, we also focus on integrations. Um, so we try to make it possible for whatever workflow um, your firm is currently using, um, you know, whether it's uh, trying to get data directly from a Revit file, um, or if you already have, for example, a BIM export workflow in place uh, where you're getting material takeoffs um, into, for example, an Excel spreadsheet. Um, we also support that process of just going from that raw um, spreadsheet file into the software. We support Rhinoceros uh, Grasshopper for parametric optimization at early stage in particular. Um, and we support energy modeling tools as well. So IES ships with one click built in. Um, and I might briefly touch on that later in the value that um, to that point around including operating impacts uh, together in a holistic assessment um, is something you can, you can do with our tools. Um, and overall, we're really just trying to be as easy to use as possible. Uh, we try to give uh, lots of upfront training. Um, so someone who may have only 
really just begun their LCA or embodied carbon journey can kind of rest assured that they're gonna be given all the tools and support they need to get started to do a high quality LCA. And then we have a dedicated support team um, who are able to answer inevitably the complicated methodological questions which, which always come up in LCA. So within the context of our building tools, um, we really are trying to do three things uh, for you guys. So we're trying to help you identify and communicate uh, the hotspots, for example. So areas in your building design where you see opportunities for improvement. Um, that's valuable for um, obviously internal um, design and improvement, but also for communicating with clients. Um, that's obviously a great way to show that you're actually adding value through these LCAs. Um, so identifying those opportunities um, and then actually uh, obviously illustrating them as well. Um, so we have a variety of visualization tools, which a few just screen grabs here of how those look. Um, and you can always export those uh, from our uh, tools. And we focus on, uh, with regards to building design, uh, we focus on trying to support designers throughout the process. Um, so obviously at the beginning of a project, in the classic kind of uh, design uh, paradox, uh, we have the greatest control over the design, but we also have the least insight into the constraints, um, the objectives, all the considerations that are important for that design. Um, so we're trying to, uh, with our tool, for example, Carbon Designer 3D, which launched this past month, um, make it possible for, uh, for you guys as designers to generate uh, realistic um, bills of materials, map those to realistic data points and get a reasonable baseline result uh, for your design, even when you know very little about it. So you might know how many stories, overall uh, square footage, um, some basic characteristics of the structural frame, um, and then maybe the climate zone, uh, which obviously helps to understand the envelope characteristics. Um, so we support an early, early stage design uh, through to concept design. So with, for example, the grasshopper integration, you can quickly explore a variety of options um, through to obviously a more detailed assessment where you're looking to really um, kind of dial in um, an accurate assessment of your building. Um, and that's where something like the, the Revit integration or importing from Excel uh, from Revit originally is a, is a great way to do that. Um, and then obviously, as, as I mentioned before, there are all those visualization uh, and comparison tools, which allow you to then obviously capture all that information, act on it, um, and then represent it um, as needed internally or, or externally. Um, and then finally, uh, you mentioned, Tom, you mentioned a little bit about ben benchmarking and baselines. Uh, so we have the Carbon Heroes benchmarking program, which um, is a way to compare um, your designs against regional um, averages. Um, and I'll touch a little bit on that, hopefully, if we get um, into the software demo. Um, so this is briefly just highlighting our integrations. Um, and I wanted to point you guys towards a few options just to kind of get started with our tools. So we have a free tool, One Click LCA Planetary. Uh, that goes from A1 to A5, um, and it includes uh, you know, local, regional, generic data, um, and it also includes those regional carbon benchmarks through our Carbon Heroes program. So overall, at one click, we're trying to be as easy to use as possible. Uh, we're trying to really holistically look at the entire construction sector and leverage opportunities for everyone in that supply chain to benefit from better data availability and quality. Uh, we're trying to really uh, support as many integrations as is useful for you guys. Um, and we're obviously also in really interested in integrating with whatever compliance schemes um, are necessary. So with LEED, we have a, a LEED specific tool, for example. Um, and I wanted to encourage you guys, so on our landing page here, um, in the top right corner, uh, we have the free trial uh, button. So with that, you can just get started, try a 14-day trial out. Um, and you can also download our Revit plugin for free, so you can experience how the Revit integration works as well. Um, so with that, I think what I might do is, how, how are we doing on time, Tom? Are we... Are, I wouldn't want to run over. Um, you're at about nine minutes. So Great. you got, you know, 
you got you got 15 or so hopefully plenty of time to excellent show us a little something perfect so um yeah and and i I guess it's it's always possible with uh, looking at the software to go down a lot of different rabbit holes. So I think the <laughs> as I'm sure as you guys all know. So um, so I think what I might oops uh, let's see resume share. Do I need to? Interesting. Um, are you guys seeing my one click LCA interface or I might have to restart this? Let's see. I'll stop that and I will grab. All right. This should work now. Awesome. Yep. Great. So I thought I would just kind of take us to uh, a landing page within the one-click LCA tool um, for a building project, um, and maybe walk through, depending on how much time we have, um, the various different ways that you can enter data. So from uh, from your building designs, um, and then also manipulate that data um, and the. The kind of nice thing about the way that our tool is structured um, is that all of the uh, analysis portion of the work happens in this common cloud environment, just in a web browser. Um, so we're looking at a project page. Um, and then what we're looking at here are design options. Um, and every time, for example, you want to um, compare uh, a Revit model against, for example, a baseline developed through some other tool, um, those are going to come in as designs here, um, and you can have any number of these. Um, so this is kind of the, the dashboard landing page where you get some results. And I've got some, some dummy designs that have just dropped in here just for the purposes of illustration. Um, and uh, you can export any of these results at any time um, as, a, as a raster image, a vector image, uh, as a raw data file. But maybe before I go into too much of that, I think I'll dive into one of our uh, pre-populated designs here and show the first way um, that you have available to you of actually manipulating um, manipulating the inputs for your LCA. So primarily that's your building uh, material quantities. Um, so here we're looking at this specific design. Uh, we've got our building materials tab. Uh, we've got a building area tab, which is really just your gross internal floor area. Uh, your calculation period, that's just the service life of your building. Um, so most of your work is happening in the building materials section. Um, and so just to orient you guys about how this interface kind of works. So we have obviously this large database of over 100,000 data points. So the first thing we try to do is make it easier for you guys when you're making material selections uh, to quickly drill down into what specific area um, or what specific types of materials you're looking to specify. Um, so uh, here we've got uh, you know, data points associated with uh, various uh, construction materials. Um, you can sort also by region, obviously the US. If you're in the US, you can sort by state. Um, you can sort by which database you're getting that information from. Uh, you can sort by whether that's generic data, so an industry average, uh, manufacturer specific or plant specific data. Um, and then you can do a few more things here regarding, for example, only looking for within that given category data points which uh, fall into, for example, the, the top 20 or the top 40 or the top 60% of, of performers based on their global warming potential. Um, so basically, uh, where, oops, I'll just go back to the entry here. Um, so basically most of what you guys are obviously handling in your design process are these building material quantities. Um, so you've got a category here uh, of all the materials and the quantities associated with foundations and substructure. Um, and what we've got here is some ready mix concrete. Um, and I'm just gonna click here on this question mark here. Um, what this is, this is a data card, uh, which gives us more information about the EPD uh, which we're using to represent this material quantity. Um, and that quantity in this case is 900 cubic yards. Um, and this is the data point that we're pulling. So um, it's a US uh, specific data point. Um, it is, uh, we have a description here. So this is one of our generic data points that we've compiled uh, based on EcoInvent data. Uh, it tells you some specs about the, about the concrete itself. 
Um, you can drill down into exactly what those Tracy impacts are. Um, and you can see here again, that ranking uh, where that stacks up compared to the other um, data points that we have within that full um, material category. Um, so what I might do is just um, give a sense for what, what you do if you wanted to change that, for example. So we've got this data point here, let's change it to, uh, I'm gonna just gonna replace that with something else. Maybe we uh, you know, actually change the spec on that. So let's look at ready mix concrete. Um, and here we've got them organized by strength ratings. Uh, let's say for whatever reason, we wanted to go to a C30 or a C35, 10,000 data points there. Um, so we select that here in our filter and I'll just start typing something ready mix. Um, let's make sure we're getting US data points. Uh, let's see what we have for Texas. Um, so for Texas, ready mix concrete, uh, C30. This might be my internet, I apologize. Or maybe it is, okay. Let's see what we get. Um, great. So, so here's an example. I, this probably didn't update, I apologize for that. Um, here's an example of a data point within that range, C30 to C35. Um, and if we click on that question mark again, uh, we can see exactly where that's coming from. So this is an NRMCA data point. Uh, we again can look at that uh, detailed information as needed, check that we're happy with all the specs. And when we are, uh, we click save. The software will update, uh, it'll recalculate the results. Um, and we should see um, that uh, now reflected here. So we're seeing this new, uh, this new assignment here of, of the data point. We also get this helpful little indicator here saying that, that just popped up there for a second, which was saying how much that actually changed our results. So this is kind of the, the graphical user interface manual way of editing a material quantities. Um, and this is probably once you've got your data in the tool, how you'd manipulate it uh, to make any adjustments um, as needed. Um, probably more commonly, what you do in the first step is you'd actually start from um, that import process. So I think I'll just go ahead and show a little bit of how that might work. Um, and maybe for the purposes of illustration, we can actually go from um, Revit can do that. So um, is everyone seeing a Revit screen? Awesome. Um, great. So yeah, so all of our plugins um, live in the software that you're coming from, uh, but they upload that data to the cloud. Um, so we have a plugin within Revit, which you can download for free. Um, and you can, uh, so we're looking here at just some Revit geometry, a sample file. Um, Within our plugin, um, you can do, you can actually do assessments within the plugin. Um, typically, uh, what I've done in the past on LCAs is, is I'll send them to the cloud and do most of that manipulation in our web tool. But the value of being able to do it in the in the plugin is that you actually can get some interesting visualizations uh, right inside the Revit model, which can be uh, pretty cool for um, identifying impacts and then also obviously demonstrating them to to collaborators and to your clients. Um, so here we can do a little bit of selection of, uh, so we've got some Revit categories of materials that appear in this model. Uh, we can select which of those we want to see sent to the cloud. For now, I'm just gonna leave all those on. I'm not gonna touch any of our other settings. Um, and I'm just gonna click LCA in cloud. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna package that data up, all of our geometries, so all of our building material quantities, and it's gonna send it to the cloud um, to, the, to my uh, license on one-click LCA. Um, so it's asking, do I wanna make a new design? Yes, I do. Which tool do I wanna use? Um, so there are, we have a variety of different building design tools, Net Zero, uh, a lead specific tool. Lifecycle Carbon is our most comprehensive tool, um, which allows you to include operational impacts. Um, and if we have a chance, we could take a brief look at that. Filtering settings, um, as for the material scope, uh, we can just use the lead standard scope of structure and enclosure. Um, and there is no data here. We're okay. Um, 
So it's just asking us to confirm what the name is, design Revit one and confirming all of those. Let's go ahead and add that. So for anyone who's done LCA before from something like a raw Revit file or, or even a bill of materials, uh, you'll know that there are often a lot of redundancy or repeating elements. So like, you know, a hundred columns or many different glazing elements, which are functionally basically the same. Um, and manipulating each of those individually is just a pain. Um, so as part of this import flow, uh, we try to make that process easier for you by giving this, um, by providing this step, which actually just collapses um, any of those bill of material entries um, based on any of these column headers, which you specify. And um, if we wanna actually just kind of drill down into exactly what we're seeing uh, when we do um, that import process, um, I'm gonna just stop and I'll show this screen instead. Um, so if we're actually looking at the uh, raw data coming from our Revit, this is what it looks like. Uh, and you can always kind of interrogate this to get a better sense for um, exactly what data you're passing up to the software. And I'll grab our uh, Revit again. Um, so I'm just gonna go ahead and go with the, the default values we've chosen here. That's gonna collapse a lot of our data points just to make that easier for us um, down the line when we wanna change, for example, our mappings to the EPDs. Um, and that brings us to uh, the mapping stage. Um, so at this point in the process, uh, we're actually, we have the opportunity now, just kind of like what we were doing in the graphical version uh, of the tool, when we were looking at that finished bill of materials, uh, we have the opportunity to, at the import stage, uh, also specify mapping. Um, and there's a pretty cool feature here, uh, which again is meant to save you guys time as you're doing these assessments, and that's our automatic mapping. Um, so basically, uh, we have an automatic mapping algorithm, which looks at the material tag which you provide uh, when you import from uh, Revit or from Excel or whatever it might be. Um, and then based on all of our data that we've been collecting, um, for example, People in the US, uh, when they used this word, um, this, they typically chose this um, data point from our database. Or um, even somebody who was using your license, for example, if you have a few floating seats at your company, somebody mapped uh, whatever this is, cast into concrete to this element. Um, and it saves that uh, mapping um, and it will remember it so that when you import that data again, um, it will, try to guess uh, what you mean. Obviously we can always change these. Um, so I'll just go ahead and change this to, this is a specific ready mix concrete. Let's change it to a different one, for example. And what you can do at this stage is you can actually save that preference. Um, so what that does is then whenever I or somebody else at my company um, uploads again, uh, a data set uh, with the same or a similar material tag, the software will attempt to make an automatic mapping and it'll tell, tell us that it has done that. So it'll, we'll see here actually your mapping, for example, or a colleague mapping if it's another um, user. So that's obviously just meant to get you quickly to a reasonable choice of materials so that you can get those early stage in particular assessments done efficiently. And I'll just click continue and I'll maybe take us to the results page. And I think that's probably it for time, I would think, okay. Great, so, uh, so the software now is gonna give us some results. It's asking us to import uh, the building service life, um, which I'll just give it now. Uh, we'll just say 60 years. Um, and it's gonna also ask us for um, the building area as well. So I'll just drop in a building area. Um, in fact, we actually already have a, a gross internal flow. Oh, we need to give it, let's give it an ASHRAE um, standard data point here. Get rid of that one. And now that we've got all of that information, we can jump to the results. Um, so we've basically taken our bill of materials from the Revit file, uh, we've added 
some additional, obviously, metadata about the building, the area, the service life. And we're now starting to get the, uh, the actual results comparison. So this particular design doesn't look great, according to our Carbon Heroes benchmark program for buildings built in quarter three of 2021 in the US. Um, and here we see for all of the uh, life cycle stages, a breakdown of all those impacts uh, by stage, for example. And in addition to that, we get all of these visualizations. Um, so we have all of these built in, uh, a lot of really cool ones like bubble diagram, Senki, whatever the case may be. Um, and all of these you can, uh, we have had questions, for example, where people want to actually just report A133. Um, that's not a problem. You can actually just eliminate these uh, unnecessary um, stages um, and see that reflected in the assessment. Um, you can always uh, download those as a raster or vector or raw data file if you want to do your own visualizations. Um, and there's a bunch more stuff in here that you can uh, kind of drill down into. So we have some uh, checkers for completeness and plausibility based again on our previous user data. Um, and we have uh, a variety of other ways of visualizing and understanding exactly where your impacts are coming from. So the most contributing materials, for example, um, and again, um, comparing those as you'd like. So I think that's probably about as much as I think we could squeeze in in that time. Um, but yeah, very much look forward to any questions or thoughts you guys have. Um, I think we have a little bit of time at the end today uh, to go through those and I will uh, stop my share. Yeah, that's fantastic. Thanks, Ari. Appreciate it. Yeah, we'll, um, we already have, Dulce has some questions going to the chat. So I, maybe we'll hold off on those. Kelsey, we'll throw to you and then we'll kind of come back around. We should have around 30 minutes at the end to, um, and also let it be known then that the, the Revit sample model that we've all seen a million times, that nice house that will cost you a $17 million in Austin is not a good carbon performer. We know that now. So thank you, Ari. So, We've so if you're in meetings, I want us all, if you see that, just raise your hand and say, by the way, it's not a good carbon performer. So who knew? But now we now we know the truth. Excellent. <laughs> all right, uh, Kelsey, you're gonna you're gonna talk a little about obviously building transparency. So we have a little EC3 and we have a little tally, and uh, you can show us all the fun stuff going on there. Great, thanks, Tom. And again, thank you to the CLF community for putting something like this on. Um, always great to connect with other um, with other like-minded individuals on this topic. So I'm very excited to be here today. So I'm Kelsey. Uh, I am the newest member of the building transparency team. Um, until June of last year, I was a structural engineer for almost a decade. Um, I'm coming from Magnus and Clementic Associates. So my background is all structural engineering, um, you know, civil engineering degree and, and structural engineering master's degree. Um, so I am not originally from the LCA or environmental space. Uh, I've kind of been slowly migrating there over the last uh, five, five or so years. Um, Building Transparency is a nonprofit. Uh, it's somewhat based in Washington, but our, our, um, you know, my my coworkers are all over the U.S. and then. Um, when our head of development is actually in Canada, um, but we're a nonprofit. Uh, we are, you know, fully do donation based and reliant on our industry partners. Um, CLF being one of the the main ones of those. So um, with that today, I'm going to first talk about Tally a little bit. I'm going to talk about EC3, and then I'm going to talk about maybe a tool that you haven't seen yet. So maybe two and a half tools <laughs> all all together. Um, so I will start with. Um, EC3 though, or sorry, Tally, and then we'll go into EC3. Um, so Tally uh, can be downloaded from our website, um, just choose tally.com. Uh, you can go in there and download a free trial. Um, anyone can use that. Um, and then once you download and install it, it is a plugin to Revit. So it is uh, within the Revit space. So you do have to have a Revit model to, to use Tally. Um, and it's just an add-in like anything else. Um, I'm going to do this in uh, real time, so bear, me, bear with me as it loads. So, okay, Tally, this is just a, you know, example model, uh, Revit model here. Um, there's multiple different functions within Tally. I'm going to focus on the full building study um, in the interest of time today, um, but there are a couple of other functions that are pretty nice as well. Uh, first thing that you're going to do when you launch Tally, uh, 
I guess I should say Tally is a life cycle assessment tool, um, a whole building life cycle assessment tool. So it will, um, it will calculate uh, environmental impacts for your whole life cycle for your project. Um, but the first thing that you need to do is define the scope. Uh, so what categories, Revit categories, do you want to include? Um, what work sets from your model do you want to include? Uh, this is a nice way to kind of exclude, include um, different elements. Um, if I had any linked models, so say this is an architectural model and I wanted to link in the structural model, um, I would see those come up here as well. Uh, so once you've defined your scope, um, Tally is pulling in all of that information. Uh, Tally kind of works in a stoplight uh, kind of figure configuration. Um, here's the legend for that. So I kind of tell people the goal is to go from gray stoplights or empty stoplights to green, of course. Um, uh, and when you get to green, that's when uh, those elements will be included in your life cycle assessment results. So these are all the categories that you asked uh, Tally to pull from Revit. And then for each of those, you'll see the different families that are included within the Revit model. And for each of those families and, and the elements contained within those families, you're going to assign a tally material definition. Um, so I'm just going to pick uh, a simple one in the sense that there's only one, um, one element to this here. But uh, so I have a concrete floor. If I wanted to find out where that is in the project, I could hit isolate in the Revit view and it'll pull it up in the Revit space as well. Um, if I go back to this, uh, this element is made up of concrete, if I switch to Imperial here, um, and it is about four inches thick. And so it's kind of nice, you can see the, um, uh, the Revit quantity information here on the right-hand pane. Um, so Tally pulls in Revit uh, quantities automatically. And so it's kind of your job to first verify those quantities, um, and then also to then assign material definitions to, to those quantities. So I'm gonna right click on, on the concrete. I'm gonna hit edit definition. Here is the full library of materials that Tally has built into it. Tally pulls from a Gabby data set. So it is a static uh, data set that was developed by ThinkStepsphera um, using the Gabby, the Gabby um, data set. That's what all of these values are coming from. It is tailored for North America. Um, so let's say that I thought it was 5,000 uh, PSI concrete. Um, I may or may not know uh, how much cement replacement is in the mix. Um, I could also pick a different region um, in the United States. Let's say that I just know it has 20% fly ash. Um, the nice thing about Tally is that as you assign a material, so we're assigning concrete, it will also prompt you to assign um, uh, accessory materials that are uh, common to those to those materials that you're defining. So usually when you when you see concrete, there's reinforcement. Um, uh, so it's it's prompting you to select that reinforcement as well. Um, so I'm going to say that there's reinforcing in in here, and then it's um, slab with a low reinforcement, for example. And so now I've turned that gray to green. And so the idea is to continue doing that um, until you've defined your entire project. Uh, and so once you do a, a definition, you'll be able to see um, what definition you've assigned. So here's that 5,000 again, here's that 20% fly ash. Um, you'll be able to see how much rebar, for example, you assign to it as well, um, have pounds of concrete. So going through and, and doing that for your entire project, um, and I'll, do, I'll pull up a project that has everything already defined and show you what that would look like once you get all of those uh, once you get all of those stoplights to green, if Revit will cooperate with you. So again, just just launching Tally. This is a different project where um, it's already pre I've already populated everything with Tally. Um, I'm going to do a full building study work set. I'm going to apply this. And here everything is green. So now I am ready to save a report. If for some reason there was something in here that you could not define and you had to keep it as gray, that's okay. It just won't be included in your results. So just good to know that. You don't have to have everything green here, but if you want it to be included in your results, you do. Um, to go through here, uh, you can hit save report. Uh, you have to fill out all of the forms in here. And then once you do that, you can hit the save button. 
And I am walking really quickly through this just in the interest of time. Um, there is other functionality that I'm kind of skipping over. But once you hit the save report, it will generate the tally report, uh, which you may have seen some of these graphics before. Um, and it'll give you at the front a, snap a snapshot of all of the tally uh, results for all of your different environmental impact categories. Um, and then these are kind of the charts that tally is known for. So um, it'll organize uh, tally results in different ways. So for example, this one's um, by life cycle stage. Um, but if you wanted to look at it, not only by life cycle stage, but also by material def, uh, division, you could also do that as well. So this is really useful when you're trying to kind of do those hotspots an analyses. So in this one, you'd be able to say that A1 through A3 is um, making up the majority of your global warming potential impacts. Um, in something like this, you would be able to see that concrete is making up the majority, but also in this case, um, finishes are also making up the majority in your project as well. So this is really useful if you're trying to um, target uh, different aspects of your project, if you're trying to focus your attention in some places. So on this project, I would focus my attention on concrete. I'm a structural engineer on every project, I would focus my attention on concrete, but this is kind of just highlighting the reasons why. Um, in the back of the report, you'll also find all of your LCI data uh, listed out. So this is every material definition that you applied across your project. Um, the mass of it, and then all of the information that is relevant to that material definition. Along with the PDF report, Tally also outputs a, a spreadsheet. So um, in these nice charts here, there are some values in these charts, but if you want to understand, you know, what is, what is the actual kilograms of CO2E uh, in this 58%, you can go to the charts here, um, the, the Excel, the Excel output here, and then you actually have that raw data. It is formatted into pivot tables, um, but it, you know, it, this, this is kind of a nice uh, way to access the values. Uh, I know some firms, um, architectural or structural, they may use uh, these spreadsheets to create their own charts and graphics um, if they're trying to tell maybe a different story to their client or if they're trying to focus their attention elsewhere for their, for their client or for their project. Um, it's just nice to be able to see these values. So that's a really, really quick rundown of Tally. So the next thing to go over is EC3. So EC3 stands for the Embodied Carbon and Construction Calculator. Um, EC3 was kind of a joint collaborative effort uh, started from Skanska, MKA, Sea uh, Change Labs, um, Microsoft, Amazon, there's so many partners that came up um, and came together to create EC3. Um, when, you, when you come, you can actually see all of our partners here. Um, and then we have many, many industry stakeholders, you know, Walter P. Moore, uh, Perkins and Will, people that are continuing to help us um, with the tool as it is today. Um, but EC3 uh, is free for anyone to use. So you can come to our page at buildingtransparency.org. You can register for free. Uh, if you do that, you will be welcomed here on our, on our kind of our landing page. At its core, what EC3 is, it is a database of environmental product declarations. Um, so that was kind of mentioned um, by Ari and, and, and Tom at the beginning, but uh, EPDs are kind of the nutrition label for um, a product or a material in your building. And so EC3 is collecting as many EPDs as possible um, in its database. Uh, so this kind of landing page is, it's kind of fun to see, you can see where the EPDs exist uh, or where they're located, where they're coming from. You can see it for the US, uh, for Europe. Uh, this one I refer to quite a bit. Uh, it still tell you how many EPDs there are within EC3 uh, broken out by different category. Uh, so you can see that concrete is winning the race by quite a bit. Um, that is partially because uh, there is a, well, because there's, so many different types of mix designs that you can have for concrete. Um, you know, you change one little thing and you can create a new EPD for that mix design. So that's part of the reason why you're seeing so much concrete here. Um, but it's, it's nice to see that, okay, besides concrete, there's um, quite a few finishes. And then from there, it tapers down. Uh, so there are more steel EPDs, for example, than there are uh, wood EPDs in, in, in the industry. Um, so that's kind of the, the landing page. Out, over here is our menu of different options. I'm going to, or functions within EC3, 
I'm going to focus on the find and compare materials and plan and compare buildings for this, um, but there is a lot more to explore too. And I'll just note that this, um, this will look different depending on what kind of user you are. I'm in my pilot user account, but we have just you know, professional users, pilot users, we have different types of users as well. Um, so some things that I, I'm seeing here as a pilot user, you may see a little different if you're, if you're a public user. Um, but for the find and compare materials, this is the way to start searching through uh, the database of EPDs. Um, so here's our material tree. Um, you can kind of see these, some of these are noted as pilot categories. Um, so they're not yet public categories. Um, but I'll go to, I'm a structural engineer, so I'm sorry that I keep going to concrete, but I'll go to concrete, um, say I want to look at ready mix, but there, as you can see, there are other options here as well, such, such as uh, shotcrete. Uh, so I'm going to go into my ready mix. Um, I can just start searching for EPDs right now. Uh, it will be a global search. So what if I want to start refining that? Um, and I'll just go to uh, the US, for example, I'll just pick a whole US, but I could go um, by state as well if I wanted. Um, I'll just stick with uh, the US for now. Um, I could also, the, the, and this, this will be different for every different type of uh, category. Uh, in, in this instance, um, you know, concrete, I'm looking at um, maybe compressive strength. Uh, if I was looking at, um, you know, a, a floor finish, uh, there would be different options here depending on what kind of floor fish, finish there is. Uh, so then I can put whatever parameters I want in here and pull up the search of EPDs. Um, like I said, for concrete, there's, there's quite a few EPDs in the, U, in the US. Um, so that's why that took a second. There's almost 10,000. And then I can see all my results. So I could continue to, to refine uh, my search if I wanted to. Um, but here are the, the results that I've, that I've come up for that. Um, so what you can do is for each of these, these represent an EPD. I can look at the details of them here. I can also open that EPD in its digital form. So every time the EC3 brings in an EPD, if it didn't start from a digital place, which a lot of EPDs don't, they start off as PDFs, um, it, it will digitize that as it brings it into the EC3 space. So this is that digital EPD where you can see not all of the information from an EPD, but um, quite, a, quite a bit of it. If you did want to see the entire EPD, you can hit this download and that will pull up um, the PDF uh, version of that, of that EPD as well. Um, so I, I actually use that quite a bit where I, I like to look through the entire EPD um, because there's just some information in here that's um, just kind of nice to look at. Um, but that, you know, at your fingertips is the digital EPD and the PDF EPD as well. Um, so also with that, if I, if I go back to this, um, I can see statistics for the collection of EPDs that I'm looking at. So for all 10,000-ish EPDs, I can see what the maximum is, what the minimum is. I can see what the conservative value is, um, and that's uh, the 80th percentile. So 80% uh, of the EPDs uh, have a GWP lower than this conservative value, and then 20% have a GWP lower than this achievable value. So um, EC3 kind of works in conservative and, and achievable uh, quite a bit. Um, also what I can do in here is I can compare these EPDs by manufacturer. Um, so this would be handy if you were looking at procurement for your project and you wanted to see uh, kind of at a glance uh, which manufacturer for your product might have in general a lower GWP. You can see that this is kind of a smattering of, of um, manufacturers, but you know, I could say, okay, I'm going to take a look at more closely at Central and I'm going to take a look more closely at CMEX uh, and Cadman because they have some lower, in general, GWP values than maybe their competitors. Um, you, you can do the same kind of thing for um, by plant and, and by product as well. Uh, so that's kind of the access to the EPDs. And then once you, or what, what you can also do with an EC3 is to start to build your project. So you can start to build your project up in, e in EC3. Um, here's all of your project information, like your name, uh, your address, things like that, uh, your area of, of the project. 
But then down here is kind of the, the core of it. You can create an element. Um, you can assign a quantity to that element with whatever units you want. And then you can assign a collection of EPDs. So if I wanted to take a look at this EPDs collection again, this is very similar to what we were just looking at where I'm collecting and, and uh, associating this certain amount of EPDs, this collection of EPDs with this element in my building. So for example, this element, these concrete foundations in this example uh, have uh, ready mix at uh, 4,000 PSI. And for some reason, yeah, and they're not lightweight. Yeah, it would be concerning if they were lightweight foundations. So <clears throat> in this way, you start to build up the different components of your project. And then once you, you have those components in there, you can start to look at different results. So you can look at a Sankey diagram. Uh, so in this case, I can see that most of the GWP is coming from the shell. Most of that is coming from the superstructure. And then where that's coming from is the decking steel, um, <clears throat> these two different uh, versions of decking steel here. Um, so there's different, different kinds of charts that we have um, available in here, but you can see kind of the roll up of all of these results there. You can then export your result, uh, reports uh, for your project. Um, there's a lot of different things that you can do with that information. Um, so you can do it, uh, you can access this information or input it into EC3 manually. Uh, that would be like, you know, adding another element here, saying, you know, okay, this is concrete spread footing or something. So I could do it that way. Or I can import um, from BIM 360. Uh, that is something that um, we kind of beta tested. And, and so it's kind of in its beta phase, but you could import from BIM 360 if your project is up there. Or you can, if you are a tally user, you can go back into your tally and instead of saving a report here, I could have hit this export to EC3. Uh, I'm not going to do that right now, but if, if I had, I would be able to see my project. It creates an instance of that project in my EC3, um, in my EC3 account. Uh, so when you hit that button, it'll ask you to log into your EC3 account and then it'll start exporting um, information into EC3. So that's what this uh, project that I have right here is. It's, it's that project that I was just looking at. Um, you can see this little tiny tally tag there. And again, I can look in here and see all of the information that tally transferred into EC3. Um, so it mapped um, material quantities from Revit. So, so tally extracted quantities from Revit and then passed those over to EC3. Um, you can also see an auto mapping of the material itself. So in tally, I said that this was reinforcing. Uh, and so that auto mapped to a collection of EPDs within EC3 as well. And then I can go through and start refining those collections uh, to, to fit the, the needs of my project. Um, so there's multiple different ways uh, to get information into EC3. Um, that handshake from tally to EC3 uh, kind of flow, goes into the uh, design workflow and then the construction workflow uh, really nicely. So those are, that's really quick on Tally and EC3. And if, Tom, if, if I have a couple more minutes, I'll just show a preview of kind of where we're going next with those tools. Is that okay? Okay. So we are, uh, now that we, now that Building Transparency owns uh, Tally, we were gifted it by Kieran Timberlake. Um, we are working on the next iterations of Tally and next iterations of EC3. EC3 is constantly changing. Um, so I want to show you, this will work. Um, we are right now working on an EC3 plugin for Revit. Let's see. So this, so similar to how Tally is an add-in to Revit, um, we are working on a plugin um, for, for EC3 as well. Um, so you would log in to your EC3 account. Um, you can create um, a project in EC3. So it will export a view from your Revit profile, your Revit project um, into EC3. Uh, so kind of similar, um, similar to when Tally was pulling in, in the information, uh, you can kind of see what information it's bringing in. Um, this take, might take a, a minute, <clears throat> but it's uh, pulling all the information that you're seeing on the screen. So where Tally um, is using uh, cat, Revit uh, material categories to pull in and uh, define your scope. 
uh, this EC3 tool is just taking anything that is visible within the Revit window that you are exporting. Um, so that's why that, that is a, just a subtle difference between the, the two, um, the, the two in the way that they interact and, and do scope definitions. So what this is doing is it's pulling in the Revit quantities. It's then taking those Revit quantities, looking at the material definition that is assigned to those Revit quantities, and then going and finding a collection of EPDs that can be mapped to those material definitions. So that's why it takes a second. You can see that it is creating this EC3 collection for this right here. Um, so that's why, why it's taking a minute. If you imagine um, you're going to the internet, essentially, every time you're going to the cloud and you're trying to pull a collection of EPDs um, to, to do that. So let's see, hopefully this won't take much longer. I don't want to take up much more time. But um, but the goal with this plugin is to make EC3 even more interactive or interactive, I guess, with um, Revit without needing to use um, BIM 360, for example and without needing to export um, from Tally, because of course not all EC3 users um, are, are paying for a license, a, a Tally license. So let's see. Okay, so this will tell you all of the, uh, how many Revit families were brought in, um, the instances for those. And then if I say open in EC3, it will open up this side-by-side -side, um, version of EC3. So uh, this is, this is not, uh, this, this interior portion here is web-based, but otherwise this is um, kind of an interactive tool with Revit. So this is the project that was created in EC3. If I went into my EC3 account uh, from a web browser, I would also be able to find that project here as well. Um, but if I'm in the Revit space, what I can do is start interacting uh, with, with Revit in a similar way that um, Tally could interact with Revit. So if I wanted to take a look at a roof and find um, where it is on the project, I can select it. Uh, similarly, if I wanted to uh, <clears throat> isolate it, I could do that as well. So you can see that we're pulling from a lot of the awesome features that Tally had um, and trying to incorporate it, integrate it really well with the EC3 space. Um, there's more things that we are working on. This tool is updated every week. Um, it is very much in the beta phase. Um, but just wanted to show you kind of a preview of where we're headed um, with EC3 next. So I will leave it there, Tom, and, and throw it back to you. Excellent. All right. Um, that was um, that was great. I, that was a little fire hose. Uh, I realize I like, which I think is good. Uh, <laughs> but but hopefully it was enough for those um, sort of still in the call to. Uh, to get some ideas um i don't know if um i know dulce you asked a couple questions and i know ari replied to one on the epds can you upload your own epds and if you have an expert level license in one click you can which i guess sounds about right that <laughs> if you if you come bearing an epd perhaps you are you are an expert of of some sort so that I think I think that makes sense. I think she had also asked about um, generally where the data comes from um, in one click, and I, I saw like Tracy was listed, and I know there's Gabby, and uh, you know, but maybe. Sure. Um, yeah, that's that's a great question. Um, I just dropped in um, a link, and I'm, I'm obviously. Um, learning how to use the Zoom chat a little bit better. <laughs> um, so that link is now, so that just brings you to um, just a landing page, which describes a little bit more detail about, um, I guess I could just for the purposes of briefly showing that. Um, yeah, where our data is coming from. So um, I, I believe we pretty much have all EPDs in the world. <laughs> um, and so that's coming from all of the, uh, all of the databases that are are out there, so EcoInvent, um, uh, from all the major um, EPD uh, program operators around the world, um, and that includes um, generic industry average data, but then also all of those manufacturer uh, reported data points. Um, so it's 
pretty much comprehensive. Um, and also, if you do find an EPD that um, is not in our database, then by all means, definitely uh, reach out to us. And what we do is typically we just run that through our just quality assurance um, process to make sure that we're happy with, uh, you know, that it's properly third party verified, um, that it meets all of our data criteria, um, and uh, we'll get included. Great. Um, so Dirk, you just made a comment. Are you, are you audio able? Dirk, could I, uh, I, I am. I'm yeah. going to mess it up, Dirk. Would you, well, would just, you uh, mind? <laughs> yeah, no, for, first, thank you both. And um, the great presentations, but what I was interested in, if each of you and Kelsey, I know you've got a couple tools, so it might be multiple answers for you, but um, you know, all data and specifically EPDs, and we're seeing as PCRs are changing and the background data going into PCRs can change, like um, aren't necessarily comparable. So I was wondering if you could each speak to how you're guiding the users or how the tool helps with, um, you know, someone making a comparison, taking the 900 yards and comparing two EPDs that may not uh, be comparable. Kelsey, I do you want, want to go first? Oh, <laughs> here, you go first. <laughs> Okay, sure. Yeah, that, that's a great question, Dirk. Um, so, uh, and I, I should admit, I'm still learning all the ins and outs of what uh, what one click software can do. So, um, my understanding is that I have actually, as I've done LCAs in the tool, I've seen a little, you know, a flag indicator that'll that'll say, you know, hold up, this data point is coming from this database, while you've got other data points coming from this other database. Um, presumably, you know, because of those different PCRs. Um, so that's, that's my understanding that we actually have some flags in place uh, for that kind of a situation. Um, generally, that our, our goal uh, with the tools is to make that um, the process of apples to apples comparison um, as easy as possible for the users so that they, they don't have to be LCA experts and they might not even need to know what a PCR is or are kind of get into all of the weeds of exactly all those rules. So yeah, that's our aspiration is to make sure that if there are incompatibilities between PCRs that that's flagged to the user or that the user just actually can't do that. Um, but as for the actual specifics of how that's implemented, I might have to actually look into that. So thanks for, yeah, that's a great question. Okay. And then for, so like quick note on Tally, Tally does have very few EPDs, but it does have those in there. Those, all of those EPDs were remodeled in the Gabby database to make sure that they were aligned in their background data set. So if it's in Tally, um, it, they are specifically, um, specifically remodeled for that reason for alignment. Um, in EC3 right now, we, that is something that is very top of mind is how to get those EPDs so that they are um, in some ways aligned. Uh, we don't necessarily recommend that users um, compare you know, different different materials to each other. So don't compare timber to concrete, for example, um, especially since we're only looking at A1 through A3 in EC3 right now. Um, but that is something that we are working on. So we have an open impact project right now, um, which is kind of a side note um, or a side project that Building Transparency is, is doing with MK funding. Um, and that is working on running new LCA models uh, this, so this is separate than EPDs, but it is looking at new LCA models and then through that methodology, how could we apply that methodology to um, EPD sets to achieve alignment between the different EPDs. Um, so we're, we're doing a lot of academic work, I would say right now to come up with a method for that alignment. Um, if we can't figure that out uh, or, if, or if we, you know, depending on the timing, we will definitely want to flag to users, um, similar to what Ari said, so that they're aware of that. But some of it, it has to do with education, I would say. I was just Googling PCR, so I was just getting educated. So I thought we were talking about COVID tests for a second, and now I'm, but now I'm with it. it product category rules at all. That all tends to make sense, actually, so. Thanks, Tom. I realized we jumped into another acronym, maybe. <laughs> It's okay. Surely, that's you okay. It's awesome. okay. You know, that's fine. I, I'm, I'm very into this stuff, and I do a lot of LCAs. But I, I mean, Dirk can attest. There's certain things that just, you know, I, like, you know, if you're not, if you're not living it sort of every day, it's. Um, but, but that, that makes a lot of sense. Apples to apples, and, you know, I, you know, I'm in the lead world. I'm just grabbing the EPDs. Go get it. Get it. Get it. And it's not like, hey, you know, we're trying to make the right choice. Are these, 
is it apples to apples? You know, what are we, what are we, what are we comparing and what were the rules of engagement and, and creating the document? And, and those could be different. So um, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't see any other questions in the chat. Was anyone else feel free? I, I have some myself. I'm happy to ask, but I could sort of go all day. So if anyone else, please jump in. Tom, I have one other one, but I'll let some others go as well. I don't know, Dirk, it might be you. All right, well, I can go, yeah. Go for it. So, so the other, our other question kind of to both of you, um, I know both, well, Tal Tally doesn't, Kelsey, I think you can confirm, this uh, pushing the bill of materials into the cloud. And Ari, I thought it was really cool how it, it leads, it can learn from what your colleagues have uh, assigned. Um, so maybe one, one question on licensing, just this would be one click specific of how, how the license works so it knows who your colleagues are. And then the other question was the, what, a, what information and how is it used and who is it available to and what control does the user have for the, the bill of materials being pushed to others? Because many times we're consultants or consultants to consultants and yeah. the owner may or may not be permitting, we, we may not have the right to release that information. So that's a great question. Yeah. And that's Sorry. Oh no, go ahead. I was going to say, yeah, I'd like to hear from both of you. Yeah. 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 It's a great question. And it's one we get a lot from, um, yeah, from architects, engineers, consultants. And as you said, um, always on these projects, there's people responsible for, for different portions of the building in terms of, you know, handling different um, aspects of, of that bill of materials. Um, so the way that it's structured in our tool, so basically um, you may have uh, a few floating licenses at your, at your company um, and anyone can download the Revit plugin, use it, um, manipulate their Revit files, however they'd like. Um, and there's uh, what we have is a, it's called like a send me data feature. Um, so the person who's responsible for the LCA, um, who kind of aggregates all that data, can send a send me data uh, link to uh, anyone who's working on a, a BIM model, for example, um, to push that data to their license. Um, so then that data gets passed to their license, um, and then they can um, handle all the import and manipulation of data is my understanding. I'm, I'm not a super expert on that particular uh, feature. Um, so basically that allows you to have any number of people working on the BIM model, um, contributing their portions, whether it's structure or envelope, whatever it might be, um, to one or more um, users working on the LCA itself. Um, and to your question about, um, you know, how the software knows which, uh, you know, who's on the same license or who's, who is your colleague. The way that will be structured is your comp you have a sort of company-wide account. Um, and if you have uh, multiple floating licenses, for example, um, you know, those will be associated, uh, you know, if you log into one of those licenses and somebody else logs into another license, um, you know, and you see that colleague mapping pop up, that'll be because somebody else using a floating license associated with your company account made those previous mappings. So that's kind of how that relationship works. So, um, but yeah, absolutely. As for the as for that sharing of BIM data, all that can be aggregated up uh, from people who don't have um, licenses, for example. But I guess for then who could who who could who can see that a building at a certain location has like when when you showed that built the hypothetical house that Tom mentioned that we've learned is very carbon, you yeah. know, <laughs> carbon heavy, but yeah. you know, that, that, you know, um, that Dirk's house looks really bad on this carbon scale. Like who, yeah. who can, who can find that? Um, sure. Yeah. My understanding is that that's, that's going to be the license owner. That's the person who has access to the cloud tool um, and actually can do those mappings in the web tool. So the person handling the BIM data in that case, um, unless they have a license, um, would only be handling the bill of materials um, in that case. Um, and, and that Revit feedback that you get within the Revit file or those analyses, um, that I believe is something you need, you need to have the license for. Um, so um, I guess maybe, 
maybe is that sounds like maybe just thinking a little bit about um like kind of acting on acting on the kind of implications of carbon results or is, is that well, kind I, of i'm just thinking like, so well i'm if thinking we're looking it, at that, yeah, it yeah. seems that the there might but this is what i was kind of asking about mm -hmm. that the the bill of materials is in some central database that one click has as it becomes potentially compared to others but what what all is when one enters this are they consenting to that and what identify so with se 2050 there's been a lot of discussion about kind of this this uh, data confidentiality integrity knowing what um what is being put up there and how it might be used so the question of like when when information's placed into this system what could yeah. be done with it beyond the person beyond the person who is the licensee yeah. is putting in the information yeah that's that's a great question and yeah it is something that we have also had come up before so when um so my understanding is when you're doing that import process and we hit like download excel and we kind of looked at that excel file with um each material quantity organized by row that's um my understanding is that that is the extent of the data that's being passed up from the um, from that BIM model. So, to the extent that that sensitive data, I guess um, it, it may be in some instances, uh, it's but you would not be able to, for example, reconstruct the geometry of that the building which it came from. So we're not actually sending like a Revit file to the cloud. We're just we're just actually sending that exported list of of, of material quantities. So arguably, maybe that's kind of the minimum that is needed to actually do the LCA. Uh, obviously, and there's metadata included in those, which you could scrub potentially if you didn't want to see that pass up to the cloud. Um, but that's, that's, I believe, how that worked. Yeah. But yeah, it's a great question. I see Katie. Or sorry, Hi, Kelsey, did you? I was going to say, Kelsey, I don't know if you had anything to add, or but Katie. Go ahead, Kelsey. I'll just say Tally is not on the cloud. So nothing that you do on Tally is is getting anywhere <laughs> besides your own computer. Thank uh, goodness so. for some of the stuff I've seen. Thank goodness. <laughs> um, but but EC3 obviously is fully cloud-based. So EC3, um, we have you know confidential confidentiality notice. Um, anything that you put up there, it is it is your data, you, you own it and you can share it as you want. Obviously, um, building transparency, we have access for it for, um, you know, just maintenance purposes and so do the developers. Um, but we, you know, when you when you sign into EC3, you're kind of signing a privacy notice with us. Um, and so we we uphold that. So, you know, I, I would never share someone's project uh, information, even though I as an admin can go and look at it. Um, honestly, I never even sign into my admin account. Um, but, but EC3 is cloud-based. You share it as you see fit or within your organization. Thanks both. Hi everyone, I was a little late. Sorry if this was covered earlier, but I was just curious if there have been any studies done where you model the exact same building in each of the tools. I know there's the Athena impact estimator as well to see what the difference or the variance in those results might be. Yeah, I'll, I'll speak to that real quick. So uh, I'll put on my SC2050 hat. Um, so I'm part of that with Sorna and Dirk. Um, that we did a, um, not a whole building, but like a structural system study. It's actually on our SC2050 website. And we um, looked at it from the perspective of one click, Tally and Athena. And the results are pretty different. Uh, what Athena, I would say is the most different. <laughs> um, but uh, the, so if you are trying to do an LCA for your project, um, you want to keep, you want to stay within your own tool. So, so uh, it's probably best to not go tool to tool comparison if you're unless you're trying to answer the question that you just asked right um, but if you're trying to talk to clients if you're trying to come up with um, benchmarks and baselines uh, it's recommended to stay within your tool that you've selected from the start now, Ari, you want to add to that sure i can add briefly and i i apologize i will have to jump off just before the half hour um but that's a great question katie um and um i'll uh I, I have seen, I guess, a little bit of those kinds of studies, and I agree. I think that uh, we have to be super careful about apples to apples comparisons, as always in LCA, um, just because of any differences in, in assumptions and methodologies. So I definitely echo uh, what Kelsey said. Um, 
And uh, with that, I might have to jump off. Thank you so much, Tom and Swarna, Gregory and Kelsey. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Ari. Thank yeah, you. We'll, we'll be in touch. Really appreciate it. Great. Awesome. Bye, everyone. See you. Bye. And Katie, I just dropped in the chat, Dirk could have done this too. I just dropped in the chat, um, the, uh, we called them embodied carbon intensity diagrams. Um, so those uh, from the SE 2050 site, you can click on um, like the composite steel office, for example, and you'd be able to see the smattering of results for Athena Tally in one click, um, if that's of interest to you. Thank you. I think we're, we're almost at time here, so I can, I can sort of let everyone go. You know, Kelsey, I have to do this just because you're here. I just want to make sure. Is an HSS really hollow and tally? Have we, do we have that figured out? Are we, I've, I just, every time I work in structural steel, I always go by like length and I find the actual like 12 by 28, whatever, and I, and I put it in because I'm always too afraid to just go by volume when it comes to my steel members. Do you, do you have any comment on that? Well, that would tell me that you're you're not so sure about your modeling practices rather than tally. <laughs> this is what Alex uh, damn. <laughs> and yes, uh, tally is correct. <laughs> uh, are, uh, is that is it correct? I no, I, I think I think actually I think our modeling is right. I've just I just I, I remember I'm pretty sure in way, way back, like first tally, like rod baits, like emailing at exe files, like or whatever we did run into it where there was like something about HSS is not actually being hollow and we got some wild numbers and I've just been very okay. scared, but this, that was literally like <laughs> 10 years ago, maybe. So I just wanted to, I just wanted to ask. I'll follow up Tom and I'll take a look, but I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure too. And it would be not. an easy comparison. I just have never thought to make it and I never go by volume, but it would make, it would make it so much quicker if I didn't go through every single steel member. So. Well, use, use by volume if you're sure about your revit practices by length would be, yeah. <laughs> Well, fair. And honestly, a lot of the ones that I touch these days, I didn't model um, because that's that's kind of obviously not the world that I'm in. So less less modeling, more analysis. So anyway, um, unless anyone else has any other comments, I think that's it. We'll we'll grab some of these links from the chat and we'll we'll send them out to folks who were on the call. And um, Kelsey, we'll be in touch with you and. Um, really appreciate the time today. I think I think that was great and hopefully enough to just get folks into it. And when we when we send out, I don't know, Swarner Greg, when we send stuff out to everyone who attended, we can put some links in to, you know, check out Tally, check out one click, just Definitely. check out something, you know. <laughs> Kelsey, I have a question. Sorry. Um, is there a multiplier that we can add to the material quantities? Um, in tally. To just bump it up. Yeah. yeah, not in tally. Tally, well, uh, you could try to get a little smart with um, how you do a takeoff. Uh, I actually don't know. So you can, you know, if you do a takeoff by volume, you can say how, how, what percentage of volume do you want to use? And that's kind of to get to what Tom was saying, where if you, if you knew that your volume was actually smaller. I've never tried to go the opposite way where you say, okay, I'm going to give 105% volume on the steel, for example, to account for connections. Like maybe that's an example of your thinking. I, I've never tried to go the other way. I don't know if, I don't know if tally flags it as no, you can't go over hundred percent or if it'll in include that. So uh, sure. I can look into that. Otherwise uh, tally doesn't have just like a quick way to do it. At EC3, you, you could easily do that, but. The tools were interesting to me and seeing it was like, it was like tally, I feel like you clean up your garbage and rev it. Whereas what I was seeing, it was interesting to me that like, if you in, in one click and also sort of the EC3 integration, it almost seemed like you could kind of just upload, you know, to the cloud and then kind of walk through and sort of fix things on the other side, if that, if that kind of makes sense. Like I, it was funny to see one click and to see tally and to see how I feel like one is kind of on this side and one is on this side, but then the EC3 plugin I felt was similarly like just taking kind of the, the bones of Revit and then allowing you to work through individual EPDs or what have you. So I thought that was a really interesting, like, look, I don't, I don't know if I'm sort of misinterpreting tally, but I certainly, it seems to me like I'm often in the Revit model, changing materials, getting the model really shorn up and then interesting to see the EC3 to the cloud and, and kind of how that seems similar to me to one click. 
Right. Yeah. I mean, EC3, you have full control, right? Um, right. Tally is, is a little more dependent on the Revit model. There are ways though, by the takeoff method and, and whatnot, there are ways to modify your Revit model without actually without actually changing your Revit model on Tally. It's that there's, there's some key components that Tally needs to know from the Revit model. Um, and, and so those key components, if those aren't correct in the Revit model, then, then Tally, you know, Tally's data is going to be off or quantities are going to be off. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. yeah, interesting. Okay, I think we're good. That was great. Hey, Thank you great. so much, Thank Kelsey. you. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Bye. team. We'll be in touch. Sounds good. All right. Bye, everyone.